All right, John Udell, Community Lead for Steampipe.io. Welcome to the Data Exchange Podcast. Thanks, Ben. So I guess the big question to start with is, what is Steampipe? I've been thinking about this, and relative to your audience, I would say the shortest and best answer is, it's a component that you can insert into your data pipelines to make it really easy to extract data from APIs and get it into the data frames where you want to do your real work. So, so in terms of uh, the end-to-end -end pipeline, it's more data acquisition oriented, right? Um, well, so again, from the perspective of your audience, it might primarily be seen as a data acquisition tool. Um, from my perspective, as somebody who hadn't looked at uh, SQL in a long time, thought of myself as a NoSQL hipster for, for a very long time. And then in my last job, I got deep, deep into Postgres and uh, kind of opened my eyes as to what's going on you know, with SQL in general in the modern world and Postgres in particular. Um, and you know, Steampipe is built on Postgres. So you know, there's, a, there's a part of the story here that is about um, you know, what you can do in SQL and in Postgres in particular, right? But setting that aside, you know, from your audience's perspective, it can be seen as a data acquisition engine that makes it really powerful to go across different APIs um, and combine information from different APIs and reason over that in a common way. So originally, John, who who's the target audience and target personas? So originally, so Steampipe comes from a context the, the company that's funding the project is Turbot. Turbot is enterprise software that is about uh, rapidly assessing large swaths of cloud infrastructure. So, you know, your AWS um, setup and, you know, but at scale, right? Like you might have dozens or hundreds of AWS accounts um, and you have resources spread across many regions. And, uh, you know, in that world, even just knowing what you have deployed is a challenge, right? And so, uh, you know, the abstraction of all of the AWS APIs into a set of tables uh, make it really straightforward to do that inventory. Um, and then also from Turbot, Steampipe brings uh, a set of compliance controls and benchmarks, a really rich and deep set of compliance controls and benchmarks that are layered on top of this, of this uh, query foundation. Um, so, um, you know, Turbot's customers are using Turbot to uh, prove that they are continuously in compliance with NIST or PCI or HIPAA or whatever the framework may be. Um, and, uh, and, and, and then the, the enterprise project product has a kind of an advanced capability of called remediation, right? So you found that you're not in compliance. You know, your policy says that your S3 buckets should be encrypted. And here's one that just showed up that isn't, right? Um, Turbot will go and enforce a policy if you tell it to, to actually encrypt the bucket that should have been encrypted in the first place. So that, that's Turbot. Steampipe comes out of that as a kind of a reimagination of how, would, how could we do the uh, assessment and scanning and acquisition um, in a new and, and, and different and more powerful way. Right. Um, right. And, so now uh, many people who listen to the podcast know that... Uh, uh, at least from my perspective, SQL never really went away. <laughs> you know, e even even actually at the height of Hadoop MapReduce, the first thing people would do is how can we put a SQL layer on top of MapReduce, right? And so, and now of course, uh, SQL is back in a big way in the data engineering community in particular. One, uh, if you look at the most successful companies in the space, they are the cloud data warehouses, right? Snowflake, Databricks, for which I'm an advisor, full disclosure. Uh, and then DBT has really kind of uh, reinvigorated uh, uh, SQL and made it kind of uh, a tool for building modern data pipelines. And uh, in fact, uh, now, now you have people who are building pipelines that uh, uh, in the past may not have, right? Because uh, in the past, you would probably use Scala or Python now people are doing that in, in SQL. So the role being called the analytics engineer. Now, with that said, John, I, I somehow I, I still come across engineers that are not comfortable with SQL, right? Yes. 
Well, I mean, they could be like the most talented developers, but somehow the set theory uh, trips them up or whatever. Or it's even just that it hasn't been fashionable in a while. And um, so they haven't engaged with it. Right, right. But but now for this audience, I think, uh, so the, so there's a group of people who are comfortable using SQL, and, but then there's also the people who are comfort, more comfortable using data frame APIs like Pandas. But but with that said, you know, I mean, they would benefit from a tool like Steampipe, I think, because basically just get the data into uh, a data frame and then they can do their work. And and yeah, Steampipe that's that's one of my observations is that um, people whose job it is to extract data from APIs um, work much harder than they ought to be working just to accomplish that. And but that's not really the job, right? The job starts once you've extracted the data into the data frame and now you're reasoning over it and running your, you know, running your experiments, running your visualization. And, and, and that's if you even have an API or figured out the API. Some some people uh, in this community just scrawl and scrape. Well, that's, I mean, the web is the original API, right? Right, right. Yeah, right, yeah. Right. As, as a matter of fact, it's kind of funny because we just um, released as a part. So there's a, one of the plugins is, is the net plugin. Um, and there's a table of the net plugin now, uh, whose name is net HTTP request. And that is essentially um, an HTTP client, right? In in, in the Steam Pipe. So what, what we should we should back yeah, up. Yeah, and, and yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, so let's say I'm interested in using Steam Pipe. I'm a data scientist or data engineer. Yeah. I, work, I work mostly in Python. So yeah. how does it, so how does it work? So what's the what's the uh, what's the workflow from installing to the first uh, uh, example? Yep. So uh, let's say that you are working with Twitter data, or maybe a combination of Twitter and GitHub data, um, and uh, you want to do that work in uh, Jupyter Notebook. Right. Um, so uh, so let's kind of just quickly review what. Steampipe is architecturally. Uh, it's uh, an app that deploys an instance of Postgres onto your computer um, and then deploys into that instance of Postgres um, an extension, uh, which is of the subclass foreign data wrapper. But, right? but from, a, from an installation perspective, I just pip install one thing. Yeah, from an installation perspective, it's, a, it's, it's one command to install the Steampipe binary on your computer. And then it's one command per plugin, right? So you would say, you know, install Steampipe, and then you would say, uh, you know, Steampipe uh, plugin uh, install GitHub. You know, Steampipe plugin install. Uh, oh, so, so each data source, you would install a plugin separately. Yeah. yeah. And then once you install that plugin, you can basically query that data source using SQL. Yes. Exactly. And, and so is each data source represented uh, by one table? So within each data source, there's no joins, just... No, there are typically many tables. Okay. Um, provided so then you, by... you, need, you need to know the schema of that data source somehow. Yep. Yeah. And there is a really good documentation on, on what's called the Steampipe hub. So hub.steampipe.io. So you look up the plugin. You know, here are the tables. You look at the table for every single table, and there are, I mean, just for the AWS plugin alone, right? There are hundreds of tables. And what is uh, what is the nature of the plugins and in these integrations? Are they so so Steampipe uh, builds these plugins and integrations? So it, th these plugin and integrations do not come organically from the community. Some do, yeah. So we're you know we've got. Uh, four or five contributors as well and that's starting to ramp up as well so we did the initial batch and we still we, we still provide most of the plugins um but uh the community is growing and we're having plugins being contributed um, so so the first question of people probably listening to this is this is great i can query all these uh, uh external data sources using kind of this unified interface mm -hmm. but how do but once i actually start using this data seriously, how do I know I don't get cut off? You know, uh, how do you cut off? So how do I know that this uh, this bigot doesn't get turned off down the road? Oh, well, it's an open source project. So, 
Um, yeah, yeah, no, but I mean, these integrations are they officially are they officially blessed by the data source? Like, is GitHub uh, or or is Twitter okay with Steampipe uh, doing this? In other words, you know, you get to a point where maybe you start depending seriously on this data. Uh, how, how stable are these data sources? I mean, I would say they're as stable as the underlying APIs. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, so kind of to close the loop there, um, if you're in your Jupyter notebook and you're doing a visualization that's drawing on Twitter and uh, GitHub data, right? So you've got Steampipe uh, installed and you've installed those two plugins, right? So you can now do things like join across, you know, Twitter and GitHub. And, and what's the, so so that data is as, is as recent as what's available in the API. So it's fresh. It's and, fresh. Yeah, and that's kind of a, a key point as well is that, um, Steampipe does not primarily aim to be anything like a data warehouse, data warehouse or a data lake, right? What it really is is a snapshot of what's out there now, or you know, recently, right? It's looking at live data through the lens of APIs, um, primarily. So, give us a sense of so name name some of the more popular uh, plugins and data sources. Um, so the well, the cloud plugins are the, the leading ones right now. So the AWS plugin, for example. Yeah, so that, the, this is the uh, community that you targeted originally, right? Right, yeah. Um, you know, but um, the GitHub plugin is also quite popular, right? There's just an enormous amount of, I mean, the GitHub API is really rich and deep. Um, and um, so, so give us a sense of what what kind of SQL queries can you write? What kind of data and what kind of reports can you run from the GitHub uh, plugin that you've seen? Um, one of the ones I did uh, early on was uh, an investigation of uh, to what extent are open source projects being contributed to by people other than the ones employed to be working on them. So I was able to look at uh, you know VS Code, for example. Um, and um, which is and, which is what I use. <laughs> yeah, well, probably a lot of us do, right? And and, and was able to um, through the GitHub API, um, but you know, with the assistance of Steampipe, making it really. But you did all you did all of this just by writing SQL. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's that's great. So so there's GitHub. You said Twitter. What else? What else outside of the cloud kind of world? So what what other? Uh, uh, well, kind let's of... take a look at uh, at the hub and see what what uh, springs to mind. Um, so there's a couple different kinds of plugins that are interesting to mention. So there's one called the Code plugin, um, and it has the property that you can join it with columns of any other table to search for secrets in that table, right? So it's a security thing, right? You know, did I leave any, you know, GitHub tokens or AWS credentials lying around in oh, yeah. any of my right. data, right? So this scans columns of other- And again, the, because, because historically this, this tool came out of the security. Y yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see here, so- but This is almost like, so you're doing like a scanner it's like a security scanning using SQL, huh? Uh, yes, yes, yeah. yep. But you know, I mean, there's a Hacker News plugin, right? So you have an API, an API in Hacker News, and I'm actually uh, working on what I think is going to be a pretty interesting visualization. Of so do you have uh, so so in in this community the kinds of data sources that might be interesting have to do with let's say economic demographic, you know, like BLS company data, yep. this kind of thing. So are those available right now? Uh, there's a, a finance plugin, right. um, but in general, I mean, for some particular data set um, that would be of interest to your audience, there likely is not a plugin at the moment. Right now. And what's, um, what's the process for getting a plugin in place? Right, so the plugins are written in Go. Um, and they are written with the assistance of a plugin SDK that handles a lot of the heavy lifting for you. Um, so when you write your plugin, your your main job really is to map from 
um, you know, whatever JSON structs come out of the API to some kind of a, a schema, some kind of a, you know, a table but, or multiple but, uh, tables. For those of us who are lazy, what's the process of getting uh, the company to write the plugin? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, if you're, I mean, for the lazy, the virtuously lazy among us, including myself, um, a really quick way to do it is just find CSV, right? So there's a CSV plugin. Right. Um, and, um, you know, so that's kind of the, the escape hatch, right? Is that anything, anything works? No, no, no. Uh, at, at what point does, uh, does the company and the community get motivated to write a plugin? How, how do you nudge? someone to write a plugin for you, I guess. Is well, I mean, it's, you know, people scratch their own itches. It's open source, right? So, I see. I see. Uh, you know, uh, one of our contributors made one for Airtable because he needed it, you know, and he's, you know, um, made a couple others because he needed them. Right. You know, that's right. right. right? I mean, yeah. So I would, yeah. So I would say in, in this case, the plugins that you guys may want to focus on for this community are kind of, like I said, like economic, demographic, those kinds of things, right? So something that you can use to, you can imagine trying to build, let's say a machine learning model and you want some extra features and information for your yep. model, right? So what would what could that be? It could be, like you said, new sources that might be possible, uh, but uh, you know, there might be standard uh, uh, features and in, 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 in uh, in terms of companies, right? So company names and economic data. Uh, this mm -hmm. kind of, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's open source. Um, so who's contributing to this project right now? Besides, the company, besides the company. Um, so we have uh, uh, a fellow named Francoise uh, Demets, and he's done, um, I think, five different plugins right now. Um, we've got, uh, let's see, uh, reminding myself about the APS group is uh, a company that's actually done a handful of plugins as well, um, and a, a few individual ones as as well. Um, and so. So you're you're in charge of uh, basically you're like developer relations for this project, right? Yeah. 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 So then, uh, so at the moment, John, so what what metrics are you uh, paying attention to in terms of uh, monitoring the health of the project and and kind of uh, setting goals for the growth of the project? We look at we look at GitHub stars. We look at um, what's happening on you know Reddit or Hacker News when we post. Uh, um, things that we've done there. And, and, and the reason I ask is you've been, uh, you're an open source veteran, right? So so has has the nature of building open source communities changed through the years in your mind? Um, I guess what's changed the most is that there's so much action going on right now, it's hard to break through, right? It's, A lot more it's, hard to cut, it's hard to cut through the noise. Right, 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 yeah. right, right, right. And, uh, and uh, in the early days, there weren't really these kind of, uh, I guess, uh, SourceForge was the uh, uh, prior repo before uh, GitHub, right? Yep. But, uh, but GitHub mm -hmm. has really become kind of the center of gravity for a lot of open source projects, right? Um, and so what, what's on the near-term roadmap? So we have, in addition to the the version of Steampipe that I've described, which is again, it's a tool that you you, you load onto your own computer, you operate locally. Um, there is a in preview. There's a cloud uh, version of this, cloud.steampipe.io, which uh, will be the hosted um, version of this. Um, so, so right now, so just just to review the the to get started, it seems quite easy, right? So first you pip install. Steampipe itself. Then, depending on the source of data that you want, you you install the plugin. Yep. And basically, you may need to look at the documentation for that data source to understand the schema and the tables. And to find examples of, of to, how to, to yeah. find examples. Yeah, yeah. And then, basically, you can write SQL. If you can write SQL code, you you can get the data. 
Yeah, and the goal is that it should be really straightforward, simple SQL 101, right? Like, and I think this gets back to part of the um, uh, reluctance of some in the data science world to kind of engage with SQL is because, you know, uh, there's a perception of it being complex and convoluted and, you know, hard to understand and hard to use. Um, but, you know, if you look at the examples in the hub, you know, a lot of this stuff is really is just using the most basic SQL constructs. And it's something that, you know, pretty much anybody could look at and go, yeah, I, I see how that, that works. And then uh, it's all Postgres, so it's Postgres SQL dialect. Yeah. And then uh, because it's pro Postgres, then uh, you're also, so how does it, so what if uh, at some point you decide uh, uh, I could use a Postgres plugin to do certain things? Uh, how do you take advantage of the Postgres plugin ecosystem uh, in this context? So we right now, uh, with Steampipe, we ship, uh, we enable a couple of the plugins that come with Postgres. So there's uh, there's one called TableFunk um, that we enable. And uh, that one lets you do things like uh, pivot tables in, in SQL, which oh, I, nice. didn't, yeah. I didn't even know was a thing. But but yeah, so, so uh, we can selectively enable um, you know, uh, other extensions that can cooperate with the Steampipe extension in the Postgres context. So for a data scientist who's uh, basically listening to this, so when they install Steampipe, basically uh, all the Postgres things that are needed get installed alongside. Yeah, and, a, and kind of a key point here is that, um, so, you know, as primarily as a user of Steampipe, you know, you might be in your terminal, you might type queries. We have a, a, a dashboard system that I'll get into in a minute as well. Um, um, but um, you know, it is Postgres, so you can connect anything to it that connects to Postgres, right? So you know, I was talking to the Anaconda folks, and I made an example of um, uh, accessing Steampipe in, um, in in a Jupyter notebook, right? And it was simply installing the you know the Postgres driver into that instance of Python connecting to Steampipe with the credentials that we give you when you launch it. Um, and, uh, but you can connect, you know, Metabase to it, connect Tableau to it, right? Like any, any Postgres client, um, you know, so this, uh, you know, this kind of shows you the, the I would say the, the power of Postgres as a kind of an emerging standard, almost like meta API for data. So, so architecturally, uh, the data doesn't live uh, locally on your computer in the following sense, right? So if it I, does, yeah. It, well, it, it does it transiently, right? It's cached, right? Um, cached, okay. right, right, right. So if I write a query, let's say related to GitHub or Twitter, then it will use the API to fetch the most recent results, and then uh, I get those results. And then if I want to write a follow-up query, that it, it will be faster at that point, right? Yeah. But but yeah. the, the point is, if I write that same query tomorrow, then it would pro it would get me the latest and greatest results. That's true. That's true. Uh, and then, if you want to preserve history, you can do that using the facilities that Postgres supports, right? So you can, you know, you can wrap your Steampipe query in a create materialized view statement or a create table statement, right? So you can, um, if you want to, take snapshots. Of the stuff and keep it around in, in in Postgres and then and then work with historical as well as fresh data. So so then uh, so uh, you end up with Postgres on your computer. So in effect, you have your you can actually interact with that Postgres uh, database separately from Steampipe. Um, yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 Oh, interesting. So so I. I think for the uh, data science and data engineering community, in a, in many ways, this is a great great addition to their tool set because basically, now rather than mucking around with different APIs, you just have to basically uh, learn SQL. Well, assuming that there's a plugin for the data source that you want, right? Yeah. So, or, or assuming you can get it into CSV or you know uh, another format that you can consume. Yeah. Right. 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 Oh, so so the CSV part I'm not clear on because if it's in CSV, why do I need Steampipe at that point? Can't I just use other? Can I use 
pandas or something else or so the idea is is again it's about kind of this power joining across diverse sources in a common way I right see. so you know uh, a thing that you might do um that i that i do do often um is uh, a query against a csv file uh, that joins columns with columns in other tables that come from potentially multiple APIs, right? Or or take two different uh, CSV files, uh, each its own schema, but with something in common, join across those. So the query is executed by Postgres. Yep. So the execution is only as fast and as scalable as your instance of Postgres on your local machine. So it's not well, no. So there's where a lot of value gets added at in terms of some high capacity uh, scanning and acquisition. Um, so um, the Steampipe architecture is highly concurrent and it's, it's aggressively concurrent actually. So, um, it, you know, if you were to, let, let's say you were scanning um, your AWS infrastructure um, and you want to, you know, find out about S3 buckets and you want to find out about those things across accounts and across regions, right? That's um, something that happens typically with a Python tool called Boto3, right? Where right. you kind of go, you know, one at a time, right? Um, and Steampipe automatically uh, parallelizes that work. And so, I mean, up to the limit of what the API is going to... But this is par on. parallelizing the extraction from AWS. Yeah. So when you're, but when you get to the point where you're doing joins across two big tables, that's Postgres, right? Yes. So then, uh, so you're limited by how fast Postgres is on your local machine because it's not distributed, right? True. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's kind of not quite big data, but big enough data. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the a lot of the most powerful stuff comes from. Um, APIs that themselves provide some kind of a search. Right, right, right. Right. So, and also, I, I, honestly, the APIs also won't give you enormous amounts of data by definition, right? Because basically, you're not going to select star and give me all of historical data from 10 years ago. They're not going to transmit that over the wire. <laughs> I mean, you can, you know, you can often do it if you if you are willing to wait and, you know, right, 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 if, right. if you want to assemble that stuff in some sort of in some sort of snapshot, yeah. Right, right, right. But I guess uh, even for me, even if I think of it as a data acquisition tool, it's all already powerful, right? So, well, I think extremely, and I think again, that's kind of the point here is that um, you know, as somebody who's wrangled APIs for a long time, um, it 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 never seems to get easier. You know, it's always about all right. Here's another API, right? It doesn't look like exactly like other ones that I've used. I have to learn how to use it. I have to find right. a, a wrapper for my language that knows how to right, talk right, to it, right? right. And, and then, and then uh, you know, it, it may come back with JSON. You have to parse the JSON. <laughs> right. Everyone has its own way of navigating the results, pagination, right. you know, uh, mapping the structures and so on. And, 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 and then when you're doing that, again, across diverse sources, and your job is to now combine things, you know, that's, uh, that's extra elbow grease that's required. That right. it really again, it's like that's not your job, right? Your job starts once you've got the raw data from multiple sources in a tractable form that you can then, you know, reason over. Because it's your job to reason over the data, not like actually just get it in the first place. I guess for me, the hesitation uh, I may have is uh, if I start depending on this data, then I'm kind of dependent on the on the connectors and the plugin being maintained, you know sufficiently enough because the these APIs may change over time as well, right? So yes, true. Right, 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 right. And uh, so so there's no so you and your company, you guys don't have a an official role in terms of of uh maintaining a core group of of these connectors. Well yeah, I mean that is that is what we do, right? So the, the core so, there's, so there must be a there must be a group of connectors that are rocks you guys guarantee this guy these guys will work right so yeah i mean you can guess right from what i've said that yeah, yeah. The one in the in the cloud security yeah. governance and yeah. compliance uh, world yeah 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 so what uh, what would be great is if you hire someone to maintain some of these more data sciency connectors 
<laughs> yeah, that's true. What would also be great is, um, you know, if uh, people in that community uh, see the need um, yeah. for something and, you know, scratch their own itches, right, with right. Uh, contributed plugins. I mean, that's what, I mean, ultimately, right, you know, to kind of wind back on my perspective on all this, um, I, um, you know, I've always having to, thought, learn, having to learn Go might be, uh, maybe if there's a way to uh, remove Go from the picture, maybe more people will write some of these uh, integrations. Um, yeah, I, I've thought about that. <laughs> yeah. all right, all right, all right. <laughs> I have thought about that. Right, 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 right. So what is your favorite, uh, what is your favorite uh, data source? That you guys support right now, so I'm sure GitHub is one of them, right? So, I think really GitHub. I mean, it's astonishingly rich. Um, what, what's going on with the GitHub API, and um, you know, um, I mean, we have visualizations of you know what's the traffic to our various GitHub repos. Um, you know, who are the external contributors? Um, you know, so so what's uh, I guess to close, John? What's the difference between the open source Steam pipe and the enterprise? steam pipe so there isn't an enterprise steam pipe okay. there's uh, an enterprise product called turbot okay company called turbot which is the company that is funding the steam pipe project um and so that's that's the enterprise product steam pipe um is in preview as a hosted offering called yeah yeah Cloud. so what so the hosted offering basically uh uh, what do you, what do you get out of the hosted offering? I guess one thing is you don't have to install anything, and all the connectors are there, right? So connectors are there, and even more to the point, with any kind of API work, you uh, are going to have to authenticate to that API, right? So that's no different, right? Whether you're right. using Steam Pipe or whether you're using Python or something else, right? right? So uh, if you have you know multiple people using Steam Pipe, installing plugins and separately configuring them. Um, you know, that's a, a fair amount of, of friction. Um, so with SteamPipe Cloud, though, you can set up a work group in the cloud, and then you do the authentication piece once for each of the plugins that you install into that. Into oh, that nice. Group. nice. So you're sharing, you know, not just the queries and the dashboards, but you're sharing. Uh, and, you know, then, the and then you access, so how do you, inst how do you access uh, SteamPipe Cloud through a browser? Mm -hmm. um, so you write code, you write SQL code right in the browser. You can, yeah. And then, and then when you get the data you want, you can export it uh, to a CSV or something. Yeah, you can actually connect um, again any Postgres client to Steampipe Cloud. Okay. As well as to a local Steampipe, right? So, so what is the status of Steampipe Cloud? Is it generally available or? Um, is it's in, it's in preview. Is it's there a preview? wait list? But yeah, yeah. but people are uh, encouraged to to go check it out. Yeah. Yeah yeah yeah. I might. Yeah I might do that. Yeah yeah. And uh, with that, thank you, John. Thank you, Ben.